Can I give you a very warm welcome to the University of Glasgow? Uh, my name is Anton Muscatelli. I'm Principal and Vice-Chancellor of the University on behalf not only of the University of Glasgow, but of course today on behalf of the President of the Royal Economic Society. It's a real pleasure to welcome you to this uh, RES annual public lecture. Um, I know some of you, uh, some of our school students have already been in sessions today. Some of you have just come along for the lecture. I uh, hope those of you who have attended the sessions today run by the Royal Economic Society have had an opportunity to see what economists actually do in society, to learn more about economics as a discipline and what it is to be an economist. Um, and it's particularly important at this time, I think, given that economists, I think, are going to be crucial, particularly in the next few years, in understanding issues, big issues like the cost of living, inequality, how we chart uh, a path out of the crisis, the economic crisis that we're currently facing. But economists also play, I think, a hugely important role in just so many of the key intergenerational challenges of our time, from designing clean and green finance for climate emergency to analyzing the efficiency of service resources in key public services like the NHS, and analyzing the economic impact of important things like transport infrastructure developments. Um, so I think some people have not, don't always have the right idea of what economists do and don't do. Uh, some people think that economists have the potential to predict the future. Uh, actually, the spoiler is we can't. And, uh, and Jagjit, uh, uh, our speaker, and I'll introduce him in a moment, will tell you uh, a bit about that. But we do play, I think, an important role in understanding how we should shape our future uh, and what we want to see, a cleaner, greener, and fairer future. So I'm really pleased that you're all here today. I hope, hope that as many as possible uh, of those of you who are at school at present and thinking about a career, uh, are thinking about a career as economists. Now, uh, I'm biased, of course. I represent the University of Glasgow. I hope many of you will consider coming to Glasgow to study uh, for a degree in, in economics, uh, either as undergraduates or postgraduates. We do pride ourselves in this university to being a community of world changers. And indeed, the father of modern economics, Adam Smith, was both a, a student here and, and a professor, and we're celebrating his, uh, his tercentenary next year, the tercentenary of his birth. But even if you don't choose Glasgow, even if you don't go and study elsewhere, please do consider doing a university degree in economics or, or consider pursuing a career as an economist. Um, as Adam Smith once said, individual ambition serves the common good. Uh, and in taking part in today's activities, I hope you'll see what it might be possible if you do set your ambitions on becoming an economist, not only for yourself, but the impact that you can have for the good of, of society. Now, uh, I should say a bit about the Royal Economic Society annual public lecture. It was established in 2001. It provides an opportunity for school students to watch internationally renowned economists present their research. Principally, it's aimed at sixth form and sixth year students. And it's become an established part of the senior school calendar. Now, this is the first time that it's come to Scotland, so we're delighted that that's happened. And our Adam Smith Business School has hugely welcomed this opportunity to engage with schools and young people about economics. And we hope to welcome you back again at various events, uh, both in the school and in our discipline of economics. Now, I'm delighted to welcome our speaker for this afternoon, uh, my friend and fellow economist, Professor Jagjit Chada, OBE, who himself is a member of the Council of the Royal Economic Society. Jagjit is uh, director of the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, NISER, and previously he was professor of economics in a number of institutions, the University of Kent, the University of St Andrews, the University of Cambridge, and whilst at Cambridge, he was also a fellow of Clare College. Um, most recently, Jagjit has been preeminent with the National Institute working on a major project on looking at the UK's poor productivity performance, which again has been much in the news, and you'll hear a bit more about that in the news and the role that that NISER is doing to coordinate some of that activity, which is actually based uh, at the University of Manchester with a number of universities that include Glasgow as well. Jagjit has had a highly successful career as an economist outside academia as well. He worked at the Bank of England on monetary policy uh, as chief quantitative economist at BNP Paribas, and he served as chair of the Money Macro Finance Study Group. He's acted as a specialist advisor to the House of Commons Treasury Committee and an academic advisor to both the Bank of England and the Treasury, uh, and to many central banks, as well as the Bank for International Settlements. In the City of London, Jagjit was uh, the Mercer's Memorial Professor of Commerce at Gresham College from 2014 and to 2018, 
and he, ser he served as a member of the UK Economic and Social Research Council's Strategic Advisory Network until last year. His main interests lie in finance and macroeconomics, and he's published widely in economics journals. He's also editor of the Cambridge University Press series on economics, modern macroeconomic policy making, and he's an associate, edi associate editor of several journals. Um, tonight, he'll, uh, to today, he will speak about one of his most recent publications, and it carries the same title as the, as the lecture, The Money Minders. And he was recognized for all his work uh, and impact uh, in the 2021 Queen's Birthday Honours when he was awarded an OBE for his services to economics and economic policy. Jagjit, it's a real pleasure to welcome you back to Glasgow and to deliver this lecture. Um, there will be a lecture, the lecture will last until three. I know that some of our school pupils may have to leave at three. I hope you don't, but if you do, please, if you're at the back, do make your way out to the back at three. We'll have a pause, but then there will be a, hopefully a real chance to interact with uh, Jagjit in a Q&A. So for those of you who do remain, there's an opportunity to ask questions and to really have a discussion with Jagjit. Welcome back to Glasgow, and please, uh, can I ask you to deliver the Royal Economic Society Lecture? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've got to say I've gone completely red, and I'm not sure I can deal with that kind of compliment. Economists are not known for complimenting each other. Anton, thank you very much. Thank you very much, as Chancellor uh, of this, Vice-Chancellor of this wonderful university, in this wonderful city, but also for all you've done for economics in the last 30 years in this country. You've been a, a friend and a constant advisor to many over that period. I want to thank you for that, to take this moment to say just that. I'm incredibly grateful to the department and the university for hosting me over the last couple of days. It's such a wonderful city to walk around. I did so this morning uh, to discover what you do to Wellington every day outside the uh, Museum of Moving Art, uh, Modern Art, I should say. Uh, and that was a very good thing to see. I like irony. I like comedy. That was very, very good. Um, I also want to thank the Royal Economic Society and the President, Tim Besley, uh, for asking me to give this year's annual public lecture. I never would have thought, uh, as a young man, uh, when I was your age, that I would be asked to do such a thing. And it's a great honour uh, for me to be uh, delivering uh, just that. I also want to thank Discover Economics as well for the support they've given in uh, helping me think about the things I should be saying. Let me start by saying it was exactly when I was 18 that I listened to a talk from uh, a prominent economist at that time, Richard um, uh, uh, Lipsy, whose book, uh, Economics, was used by all students of my age at that time. And I should say that my subsequent career is not actually uncorrelated. Uh, I wouldn't say causality uh, to an economist, but not uncorrelated to the exposition given by, by uh, uh, Richard at, at that time. And he explained very clearly what an economist can do. And an economist, in my view, is there to try and improve public policy, to make the lives of people better off than they would otherwise be. There's a lot of things in there about how we measure well-being, what are the counterfactuals, how much worse might they be if less good policy is used rather than good policy being used. And so what I'm going to talk about today is how we think about monetary policy and how we think about using that over time to make people's lives better off than they would otherwise be. And that's an incredibly important objective, I think, for economics. It's often misunderstood in terms of what we see as our profession. We are a profession of public policy analysts, trying to use analytical tools to project better policies. Where it's hard is getting people to understand them. Where it can also be hard is getting our beloved politicians to follow our advice. That is in itself an art which I'm not sure I've yet learned. But others are working on that. And what we also want to do is pass on what we've learned to the next generation so you can also work towards the better future that Anton uh, was outlining, that maybe, with your help, we can achieve far after I'm uh, left this mortal coil. But uh, that would be great if some of you can carry on some of the things that we are um, concerning ourselves with. So today I'm going to give you a, a short uh, uh, and robust <laughs> run through some of the issues that have occupied the minds of uh, monetary policy uh, makers. And you'll, you'll kind of learn that first of all, when we talk about economists, there are actually uh, three types of economists. And I'll leave you to work out which type I am. There are those who can count uh, and those who can't count. Uh, uh, and I'll leave you to work which one I am. Just to wake you up after lunch. Now, my contention 
And the thing I want to get across to you as young people today is that the history of monetary policy and the way it has evolved to where we are now is not an accident. It's a result of a lot of learning, a lot of analysis, a lot of empirical work, a lot of failures, some successes, possibly more failures than successes. Uh, and it, it leads to a particular story. And the story starts with monetary standards, whether they're gold standards or silver standards, or, 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 or the use of cigarettes in, in prison of war camps. Of course, I'm not in any way advising anyone to take up smoking, but we kind of find over time we need a means of exchange, we need a unit of account, we need something that can help us count uh, in a timeless manner the value of our output and allow us to exchange. This is what money is essentially doing. And we had monetary standards that operated for the largest part of human history, which were taken as something outside of our control. We didn't have a democratic process. We didn't have the idea whereby governments were necessarily operating in a way to try and help well-being for the whole of the population, to some extent reflecting Hobbes' contention that life was na nasty, brutal, and short. You just got on with it. It was almost the ultimate conservative statement about life. Whatever it was, you just took it. And at the end of it, you were dead. I'm afraid that's the way, for a long part of human history, things were treated. But and, you know, in great part as a result of the work done in this country, in this wonderful country, and I mean Scotland when I say that, the Scottish Enlightenment, we started to think, how can we improve things for people? How can we design things to make them better? And the apology of that, I think, was, was very much what happened in the middle of the 20th century, where governments not only learned to say, look, I, I should be taking responsibility for this as part of a democratic mandate, but I will be accountable for the successes I have or don't have in trying to improve the well-being of people living in my country. That's a radical shift from what was going on in most democracies prior to that period. And we see that with the work of Beveridge um, and Keynes, both of whom were intimately connected with the establishment of the National Institute of Economic Social Research in 1938. Um, and, and so we had a period where we almost said, OK, now that we think we can control the economy, let's do it as much as we can. Let's try and stop uh, boom and bust, which is an expression that I think has been used by various politicians in the past. Let's have uh, a, a, an attempt to reduce the volatility of the business cycle and see if we can bring out better outcomes for people. But then we learned that that fine tuning was problematic. It was subject to a large number of what we call in economics bits of incomplete information and incomplete control. We don't have perfect knowledge. We don't have instruments that are perfectly correlated with the shock that we're trying to offset. We don't have enough information to use it in time. There are tremendous lags in the operation of these things. So in fact, our ability to manage demand and the state of the economy was limited by a whole set of informational and operational constraints that became obvious in that immediate post-war period. And then we developed a notion about the science of monetary policy. Maybe we can then step back a bit, reduce our ambition for complete control of the economy, and ask ourselves, should we be doing less and following some very simple rules? And maybe that can deliver more stability than trying to interfere too much in a system. Many of the ideas I'm talking about here can be applied broadly to many areas of economic policy. So even though the example with which I'm relating this story to you today is about monetary policy, much of it relates to any economic policy intervention that you might be thinking about or talking about with your friends at school or indeed your families at home. You know, what should be done in response to what's going on is always subject to severe informational constraints as to the appropriate response. It's not as simple, and I forgive me for saying this, as many colleagues and friends from the economics department here, uh, it's not as simple as textbooks will tell you, <laughs> but we know that as well. I want to ask ourselves if we ended up in this very compact world of simple rules, and I mean by simple rule the inflation target that we adopted after the exit from ERM in 1992 and led to the development of central bank independence in 1997, question then to ourselves, was that over-engineered? Was it too narrow an objective? Was it something that was missing fundamental forces in the broader economy that ought to have been addressed by some other sets of policy interventions? So in terms of were we missing the main story? Was there, a, was there a Greek tragedy in operation 
where all the danger was somewhere off stage, and we thought we were in complete control of the problem, and yet was it the case that Nemesis was awaiting hubris? And that's one way of thinking about the, f the global financial crisis, which is very fresh in my memory, but I realize to people in this room, you were four or five at the time. That's one of the issues that I keep having to remember. The things that I think everyone knows, they don't necessarily know. I remember uh, uh, as clear as anything the day that we fell out of the ERM in September 1992. But I'm also shocked to learn that was nearly 30 years ago. Uh, and that was, the, that was the very week I started my first proper job at the Bank of England as well. So I, that gives you an idea of just how old I am but also how we need to use these occasions to pass these bits of knowledge on to the next generation, because there's no way you would necessarily know that, uh, unless you're unlucky enough uh, to be the child of economist parents, which I wouldn't wish on anyone except my own children. Um, so having gone through that analysis, we've got to ask ourselves, where next? And that's where I'll try to end the lecture at 3 o'clock, and hope most of you will be able to stay. <laughs> so let me... On the back of, that, ward, on the back of that, that, that broad sweep, bring you right down to the present and, and sort of say, what is going on right now? You would have heard of the cost of living crisis. Cost of living crisis is just another word for an unanticipated inflation. What is an inflation? Well, what we tend to do is think about measuring the price of the normal basket of goods and services that we buy. That gives you the price level. And the rate at which that changes is inflation. We have a notion whereby an inflation target should target an inflation rate such that the day-to-day, month-to-month changes in that price level are imperceptible. You don't notice them. But we tend to have a small positive target for inflation because we think that the quality of goods and services is increasing over time. So it's appropriate that their price goes up a little bit. And we also think a little bit of inflation might help adjustment in the real economy. I'm not going to explain that in too much detail. I'll leave you to go and talk to your teachers about that a little bit later on as to why that might be. I don't want to give you all the answers today. I'll set a little bit of homework in keeping with the professor. So a cost of living crisis, another, another way of putting that, is simply an unanticipated increase in the level of inflation over and above we've become accustomed to. The MPC was formed in May 1997. It's just celebrated the main the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England, a new committee set up to set bank rate in order to stabilise the gap between demand and supply in the economy, so inflation settled at something consistent with price stability, which I've defined as around 2%. Set up 25 years and one month ago. Was charged with hitting an inflation target of 2%. And indeed, the inflation rate over that 25-year period has averaged 2%. It's actually done its job. It's actually one of the, I should say this, and I have to be careful how I say this, it's one of the few institutions, along with the University of Glasgow and the National Institute of Economic Social Research and the Royal Economic Society, that has been doing its job in this country over the last quarter of a century. There have been many, many failures. But perhaps just now I won't go into them all. I don't want to disillusion you at such a tender age. So this inflation rate, you can see... To the left of that vertical line is the history of inflation, going back to 2018. You can see it's around 2%, despite Brexit and COVID and things that are coming along. You can see this gradual increase in inflation caused by a number of things we'll talk about briefly over this lecture. So that's an injection of demand into the economy from the interventions of the Treasury through fiscal policy. These were the expenses associated with the furlough scheme, injecting a bit more demand in the economy to sort of limit the impact of lockdowns, and also a further injection of monetary stimulus in the economy by a cut in interest rates at about the time of March 2020. We know that demand takes time to swill into the system. These are the lags that we talk about. It doesn't happen automatically. Running the economy is not like, I'm careful with this analogy, many people don't like it, it's not like driving an electric car. Let me get that right. You know, when you press the accelerator, it doesn't accelerate immediately when you press the brake. It doesn't slow down immediately. It takes time for it to work its way through. So those demand injections from 2020 are still out there, swilling around not only the UK, the whole global system. And we're a global economy. So what goes on in other parts of the world affects us. If the US or the euro area has lower interest rates and is expansionary, ultimately that is something that affects global prices that affects us as a trading nation directly. And on top of that, set of demand impulses, you've also got various things happening to supply. As we 
started to emerge from the COVID cloud, many parts of our normal production processes were not in the right place. It was not as easy to access things as it was in the past. This is what's been called the supply chain issue that was becoming obvious uh, during the course of last year. That's making it more difficult to achieve your plans as an investment, uh, as a, uh, investment plans as a business, or indeed for you to source the goods and services you may want. That's what we mean by a supply chain problem. And then contemporaneously, we're finding energy and food prices going up because that demand is swilling around the system. And then there's this war in Ukraine started uh, by Russia, in, by a Russian invasion and a horrendous event, something that will have important implications for all our lives, it seems to me, further ratcheting up oil and food prices. So what you have is a combination of effects that's raising the inflation rate. And to see, understand how we relate to that as economists, the green line there is simply showing what Nisa thought would happen to inflation as a central case in February. And then three months later, you've got the bank in the blue line and then the extra red line showing what we thought three months later. So there's the learning process. So even though people thought inflation was taking off, the subsequent news we had over the next three months led us to revise up our view as to where inflation will go. This is the learning point. You just don't know everything when you make a decision. And the big debate there, let me just say the blue line is the blue line, the red line is the one underneath. The, the, the bands around it are the error bands. As Anton said some moments ago, we, we don't know the future. A real forecast is one where you're projecting the distribution. What you think is going to happen probabilistically across the spectrum of outcomes. Your central case will nearly always never be right. What is important is to understand the distribution. So these red bars are a way of understanding where we think we're going to go. So a couple of things emerge looking at this, is that it looks like three or four years down the line, we're going to retain price stability because it's coming down to 2%. But until then, we're going to be way above the target. Now, there are two questions that emerge. Underpinning that inflation path, what policy interventions are required in order for us to get back to 2%? Will it happen of its own accord, or will it happen with a particular change in policy stance? Because the inflation rate, economist lingo coming up, is endogenous to the policy response. It's not by itself something that happens on its own. And for those of you who follow the debates, you might have heard of a debate between team temporary and team permanent. Was the inflation shock that was emerging last year temporary? In the sense, was it going to go back to 2%? Or was it permanent? By which we mean, was it going to go way above 2% and stay there for a very long time? This debate was actually fallacious. As many debates are, you'll realize as you get older. A lot of noise, a lot of heat, but not a lot of light. Because whether the inflation rate is temporary or permanent is always and everywhere a function of the central bank response. It's not something that is, another word coming in, exogenous. It is endogenous, controlled by the central bank. So the debate was in itself something that, I shouldn't say made me angry, but, but you know, worry, of concern. I think that's the appropriate language these days, of concern to me. So the question was, what policy interventions were required by central banks around the world to ensure that the inflation rate was temporary? And then they're using data. This, that's how you get these forecasts and these, these uh, risk charts that was essentially based on the last 30 years of price stability. So it could very much be the case that the forecasts would be underpredicting um, how long the inflation would stay in place because this is not the type of shock we've seen before. In other words, the data had no information that was relevant to the sequence of shocks we've now suffered as a result of COVID, the re-engagement of the global economy, and a war in Ukraine. So we've got to ask some severe questions about these. And I will, so I've started with a, a, an exposition of the issues, and I want to go on and help explain that central bankers think about this. I want to, if I may, leave you with, um, or start off with uh, a puzzle and see whether we can get an answer at the end. I, I have put up a picture of two well-known Scots who had a lot to do with the development of thinking on the economy and the monetary economy. 
Uh, I'm not going to name them, but at the end of the lecture, I'm going to come back and see if people do know their names. That'll be a little bit of a test. I'm sure you'll know the answer. Let's see if you do. I should say they were great friends. So the questions I want to answer at the end of this lecture are, why did we move away from a commodity-backed currency? You don't have to go very far in economics before people start to argue for the return of the gold standard. Next question is, what have central banks learned about short-run demand management? What do they now know that they didn't know when they started this process half a century or more ago? And what do they accept that they will never know that will limit their ambition in terms of what they want to do? These are incredibly important questions to answer. And finally, we might want to ask ourselves, do they need a different objective? Do we need to move away from price stability? And I'll give you very brief answers to those questions right at the end of the lecture. I'll try to do that on time. Slightly nervous now. So let me start with um, a measure of well-being. This is a measure of well-being um, constructed with, with good friends of mine, Jason Leonard and Ryland Thomas. Jason Leonard's at the LSE, Ryland Thomas at the Bank of England. We've been looking at uh, UK output. That's the measure of the real quantity of goods and services produced by the economy in every year from 1700 to uh, the most recent period, 2020. And we've been trying to understand the prevalence of recessions, the vertical gray lines of recession. And a recession is simply where the economy contracts, where we produce fewer goods and services in real terms than we did in the previous year. That's what a recession. Don't let anyone tell you it's anything else. That's what a recession is. And you can see we get a lot of recessions. But what I want to draw your attention to is over the long run, we've been getting better off. If we look at, in real terms, output per head, in, in current terms, 2020 terms, it was about £1,600 in 1700. And by 2020, it was £30,000. This is the real A measure. It's a noisy measure. It's a measure we can challenge. But the broad trend is something we agree, that we're considerably better off some 18 times better off than we were 300 or so years ago. That's to do with technological improvement, productivity, total factor productivity, all these things that we can talk about in economics. And I want to say that, in fact, that long-run path has got nothing to do with monetary policy. That long-run path is set by things we think of as real. So the resources we have at our disposal, our ability to turn um, inputs to outputs, the level of skills that we've got, are all outside of the realm of monetary policy. What monetary policy is about is trying to stabilise the path to reduce the volatility around that. So these fluctuations that we're showing there with a better designed monetary policy can matter. And that can matter because the fluctuations in activity will lead to inflation or unemployment that will tend to hit particular parts of the population more than others. So it matters for welfare. The current inflation that we've got is something that is more keenly felt by people in lower income bands than others. When people lose their jobs in a recession, it's often people in more precarious uh, jobs who lose their employment and their lifetime prospects. So in a sense, what monetary policy is trying to do is limit those fluctuations, which matter for people who live finite lives. I'm not going to live 300 years. So I'm not going to live long enough to be able to deal with lots of recessions. So if I can reduce the volatility of the economy and reduce the frequency of recessions, I might be able to take me, make people better off. But the economy will still observe or behave in this long-run path, which is about one to one and a quarter percent increase in income per head or average living standards every year. That's what we're observing in the economy. And one way to think about short-run fluctuations is the inflation rate. Inflation rate is typically thought of as something that emerges from a dislocation in aggregate demand and supply. If demand is racing away with itself, we get an inflation. If demand is not racing away with itself, we get a deflation. And we can see that in the, 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 the long period of 1700 um, through to 1900, uh, the inflation rate was around zero. In fact, the price level was zero of that. There was no drift in the inflation rate. But the problem with this particular regime is it led to, it had associated with very large fluctuations in inflation from year to year, which meant that those people on fixed incomes, farmers, 
labourers, people working for colleges, you know, all kind of had tremendous changes in their standard of living as a result of these, pay, these inflationary shocks. And as time went on, as we became more democratic, people were thinking maybe there's another way of doing this. So we moved away from a commodity standard in which the price level was constant but had very large year-to-year -year fluctuations to something ultimately where it could be controlled. Now, there are a lot of experiments with the control of inflation, and what we can see in the latter part of the 20th century is that we kind of let inflation move away from itself. We didn't design an appropriate nominal anchor. We didn't have an institutional device that maintained inflation, but more importantly, was credibly thought to lead to a stable level of inflation. For all of us, when we're planning, the expected level of inflation is incredibly important. You don't have a set of institutions that you believe in, you're going to want to try and do better for yourself than uh, the Norman Lanker would determine that can lead to a drift up in a persistence in the inflation rate, which we can see in the, in the 70s and 80s. And a lot of talk at the moment about whether there's a return to the 1970s. I'll come back to that a little bit later on. The only other thing I want to bring to your attention here is that the other solid line is bank rate. That's the policy rate. You'll maybe look towards Thursday when we'll hear about the Monetary Policy Committee's next decision on bank rate. This is the main tool by which we're controlling aggregate demand in the economy. And what I draw your attention to is the most recent period since the financial crisis is wholly unusual in that bank rate has been far below the inflation rate, implying negative real rates. Now, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about that, but I just want to point to the fact that this has been an incredibly unusual period. And that's why many people say that rates are abnormally low because it's far below the level of inflation in the economy. So what we have to then think about when we're going to try and limit fluctuations in the economy, and strictly we mean inefficient fluctuations in the economy that lead to unemployment and inflation that's problematic. We also have to understand what's going on in the economy, and that's when it gets very hard. And here are simply illustrated bank rate, which I've already talked to you about, and an index of output in the interwar period. I'm now told it's called the transwar period. So, you know, life moves on and language moves on, so it's the transwar period now. So you're kind of almost treating World War I and World War II as one event with this small interregnum between the two. And you have a world in which, after World War I, bank rate is at 6%. And you can see over that period there was, there was a reduction as we move to the left and then back out again, and then there's a cut in 1932 to 2%, where we stayed throughout the 1930s, and the cut in 1932 was the year after we finally left the gold standard once and for all in 1931. That cut led to an exchange rate depreciation that allowed us to avoid the worst impacts of the Great Depression. It's often said erroneously that it was a Great Depression in the UK. There wasn't. It was a US phenomenon. And we actually insulated ourselves with an exchange rate depreciation by leaving the gold standard in 1931. Interest rates were kept low for the rest of the 1930s, and actually we didn't do too badly in the 1930s as a country. So it's important. I'm amazed by how many people think there was a Great Depression in the UK in the 1930s when I go around. But if you're running this kind of policy, you need to know what's going on in the economy. And the problem at this time is we had no national accounts. We didn't really know what output was. All we could observe were interest rates, we could observe the exchange rate, and we could observe, observe some prices. So 100 years later, we're able to reconstruct what was going on in the economy at this time in terms of a measure of output and a measure of what was going on in the money markets and try to understand whether the recession of the 19, 20, early 1920s was related to mistaken monetary policy. And what do I mean by mistaken monetary policy? Well, we went off the gold standard temporarily during World War I and found our price level higher than our main trading partners. And yet, we wish to return to the gold standard at the previous exchange rate. So you've got to think in terms of the fact that your domestic prices have gone up, and you want to go back to the gold standard at the previous exchange rate. In order to do that, you need to bring your domestic prices down. And you do that by having a monetary policy that's too tight. Remember that previous chart, we were starting at 6%. If you're starting at 6%, and you've got a deflation, you've got a very high real interest rate in the economy. And the economy went through a very deep decline. In fact, this was called the Great Slump by Pigou at some point in the later. In later. 
And this modern work that tries to understand was the cause of this great slump, real stuff that was going on, productivity or, or labor supply or, or some taste shocks, or was it to do with monetary policy? And I put this up simply because it's so clear it was to do with a badly designed monetary policy. It correlates with the, neg with the narrative that we had at the time. It also correlates with what Keynes was saying at the time, because he also said we shouldn't go back at the previous exchange rate, we should go back at a depreciated exchange rate. And the modern results suggest the same. And so we get a world in which a well-designed monetary policy, you can see in the 30s, was contributing to a growth in output temporarily, but a badly designed monetary policy in the early 1920s looks like it was contributing to a recession known as the Great Slump. And at around this time, the Keynesian Revolution was, was forming. And the Keynesian Revolution is essentially an argument along the lines of, in the short run or in the medium run, there doesn't have to be one level of output in the economy. There can be lots of levels of output determined by the level of demand that's injected into the economy. So this observation that by increasing government involvement in the economy, or analogously by cutting interest rates, you could amplify the impact on the economy through a multiplier mechanism and increase output. This could go both ways. You could reduce government expenditure and amplify the downturn, which is an argument often made of the period since the global financial crisis. What I want to point out was the Keynesian story is that you can have different levels of activity in the economy, the government can influence them, and so the government can choose. And if the government can choose, the government is responsible. You see how these things all come together? I'm sorry, Eugene. So we can amplify and dampen fluctuations. This is the story we're left with, both of That directly then leads to the demand intervention points. The final point of the jigsaw was that we needed a menu. Was this a free lunch? If I expanded output, did it come at no cost in the economy? Well, a very well-known New Zealand engineer decided to do a couple of degrees at the LSE and discovered a Phillips curve. His name was Bill Phillips. And he says, look, if I want to do something about unemployment, which read output, there will be a cost, because if I try to reduce unemployment, there will be an increase in wages or an inflationary consequence from it. So I have there a menu of choices at my disposal, a trade-off. So yes, I can intervene in the economy, I can be responsible, but there will be a cost. This is where we landed up in the immediate post-war period, understanding that trade-off. Then, we've got to ask us a further question. Jan Tinbergen, the first Nobel Prize winner in economics. One of the things he's famous for is the target instruments idea. So I want you to imagine the first instance that dotted in the, in, right in the middle of concentric circles is, is where you want to be. Some level of inflation and some level of output are consistent with the long-run level of output in the economy. Each concentric circle, as you go further out, is less valuable to you than being right in there. But if we put an equal weight on inflation output, your indifference curves will be concentric. And Timberg is saying, well, if I want to get from the cross to the dot, and I care about inflation and output, I want my inflation to be at an inflation target, and I want output to be at some full employment level that is not inflationary, and they're not related to each other, I'm going to need two separate independent instruments to get, me, get my inflation rate down and to get output down. I can't just use one instrument if there are two separate objectives. So the counting principle was also developed. So if I want more than one objective, to, if I want to reach more than one objective, I need more than one instrument. They have to be independent and not affecting each other. So you don't want the use of the instrument to control inflation also to affect output in a more problematic manner. Then they have to interact. But we also discovered that actually finding independent instruments is very hard. They do tend to be related to each other. That's where we sort of move on from there at the moment. So the first point is, how do we interpret that? Well, it kind of means don't have too many things for the central bank to do. I mean, don't ask it to be worried about distributional consequences. Maybe don't ask it to worry about net zero. I'm not saying these things are not important. 
But I'm saying they're maybe not things we should be asking the central bank to do. Maybe they're things for some other government body to be thinking about. And there's a further problem. Not only have you got an instrument problem, you've got an economy constraint. The economy, one way of thinking about the structure of the economy is a constraint. I've already described your bliss point where your inflation and output level will be exactly at your target. But what if the economy itself doesn't allow you to reach there because of the particular relationships that exist between inflation and unemployment, conforming to that line there? So then we have to be clear we live in a second best world. We can't necessarily get inflation down to the target. We can't necessarily reduce unemployment below a certain level. We have to build a social consensus around the point of the constraint and not try to do better than that because it is infeasible. It's incredibly important. And that is then important work for central bankers and other policymakers to explain that to people. So that is the objective that is pursued. And there's more of a problem. These are all things that will be picked up in the post-war period as we start to think about demand management. What if you're, the thing that you're trying to control inflation and you're using bank rate to do it, what if you can't control it perfectly? What if when you use bank rate, which is your instrument to control inflation, you're injecting more uncertainty into the system? What if the structure of the economy has changed? What if it's a weightless economy? What if you just had a pandemic and you're not quite sure whether people are going to come back to work in the way that they did before? And in that world, you'll say, well, actually, the use of this instrument might also inject some variance into the system. I don't quite know how it's going to respond. So you've immediately got yet another trade-off, that even if you have bank rate to try and get inflation back to the big blob there, halfway up the y-axis, if you're also worried about inflation variance, you're not going to want to go all the way up to C. You're going to accept an undershoot in inflation, because inflation variance is also a problem. Why is it a problem? Because we know uncertainty about inflation particularly hits certain types of households more than others. We've got particular uh, limited discretionary spending available to them. And if we hit them with inflation uncertainty, they're going to be much worse off than otherwise. So therefore, you might have, even if you want to get back to your target level of inflation, you might accept an undershoot. And if you flip this chart over, if you were above your inflation target, you might say to yourself, you know what? I'm not going to try and get all the way back to target because I'm not quite sure how the economy is going to respond. Maybe I'll stay above target for a while because I want less uncertainty in the economy rather than more. It is an argument for gradualism and conservatism with a small c, let me be clear, in Scotland about that. So, nearly there, Anton. <laughs> check that. My watch is always slow, 15 minutes, good. Okay. I'll just have a sip of water for me. Democratically elected governments have the tools and the responsibility and the obligation to try and run the economy, to limit inefficient fluctuations in the economy. But we know they can't do it perfectly. They need to explain that they can't do it perfectly and limit their ambition, not try to offer to do too much. There was a debate after the financial crisis about whether central banks are the only game in town. These are the one institutions that we were asking to run the economy. Were we ultimately asking them to do too much? Do excuse me. And the way we offset that is to limit our ambition. So we have got perfect information. You need to define the target in a way that's consistent with the constraint the economy is observing. You need to accept that we've got trade-offs, that the instruments we're using are not a form of perfect control. There's a lot of uncertainty in the way that they operate. And we have the typical uncertainty of uh, trying to identify a shock, trying to work out what you need to do in response to that shock, and realizing that any response will have a long lag before it has an impact, and another shock may come along. What we love in economics are models in which we have one shock, and we sort of say, well, that's what's happening in the economy, and there's the optimal response. Of course, in the real world, any one shock persists, and just as you're beginning to understand it, another one comes along, like buses. And then you've got to try and work out what to do. That's the real problem. And that's also the problem we're currently facing. OK. And then, so, so we've compacted the problem. We said, OK, we can only do a little bit. Were there any other problems that we learned? Yes, there were. 
What we learned, and I know this from this room, that, is that people are smart. The system itself evolves to understand what the policy interventions might have. It's a little bit like, can I use an example of viruses evolving so that you know, the vaccines don't work in the way that they did? And this is something that economists have been worried about for a very long time. And this led to a very severe critique of data-driven decisions, because the way people behave will change when you change the policy rule, known as either good arts law on this side of the pond or the looks critique on the other side of the pond. And I'll explain that with an example. And there's another problem. What if we don't understand the economy? What if the economy itself has a structure, remember that constraint, that we don't know for certain? Because if the data isn't telling us the, the true underpinnings of the economy, it could be that the data is misleading us as to the state of the economy. How do we respond then when we're not sure? And what if we're not credible? What if we are credible? What, what happens if the agents with whom we're trying to trade or contract don't believe in our attempt to try and control inflation? What happens there? Well, we'll see that leads to an inflation bias. Let me take a few minutes of your time to explain this. Let me explain the problem with econometric evidence. And I hope in this room, this is the right example. So I want you to imagine there's an English goalkeeper who's about to play in the European finals in Wembley. I'm sure it never happened. And uh, there's a penalty shootout. And the English goalkeeper knows that the final kick will be taken by the Italian number 17. So the English goalkeeper has got an econometrician on speed dial in the changing room before the penalties. And says, look, can you please tell me where number 17 kicks the ball during a penalty? So at the end of the speed dial is, is Arnab over here. And he, he uh, immediately uh, goes back and says, number 17 always kicks to his right, and he always scores to his right. He said, really? Is that right? 95% of the time, he kicks to his right, therefore you must dive to your left. Okay. So the English goalkeeper goes onto the Wembley turf. This is the final kick of the game. If he saves it, England win the European Cup or European Championship, whatever it's called. Football is not my sport. Um, and if he gets it wrong, the Italians win. But he knows from the econometric evidence that number 17 will kick to his left. So he jumps to his left. But what happens? Number 17 knows that the goalkeeper has asked for his empirical evidence and knows that it's well known in public information that he always kicks to his right. And therefore, he's already worked out that the goalkeeper will jump to his left on the basis of the public information. So number 17 will just keep the other way, knowing that the goalkeeper is going to go to his left. Italy score the goal, and England lose the final. Which, of course, is exactly what happened last year. British empiricism at work. This is, at heart, the Lucas critique of Goodhart's law. As soon as the individual with whom you're contracting understands that you're using evidence that you've already given, they have an incentive to change their behavior. And in this world, the econometric, evidence, the econometric evidence doesn't help the goalie at all, and England lose the final. Of course, you then may argue that the goalie instructed by Arnav says, well, I, I know he's going to change his mind because it's public information that he always goes uh, to his right, my left. So I'm going to go to my right. But then this game, at that point, starts to deteriorate because number 17 might also know that. So then the appropriate thing, once you work that through, is for number 17 to randomize. But I'll just leave it there for the moment. If number 17 knows the incentives based by the goalkeeper, he will have an incentive to change his behavior. What if we don't know the structure of the economy? What if there are three ways the economy may work? People may be forward-looking, they may be backward-looking, or they may be a, an average of the two. And suppose you've got three central bankers, Schultz, Chatelain, and Clegg who also don't know uh, uh, the structure of the economy, but they are going to have a belief. One believes that the economy is forward-looking, one believes that it is backward-looking, and one believes that it's hybrid. And you see that very simply, 
If it is forward-looking, which is the top rank, and Schultz believes it's forward-looking, Schultz will be the winner, because Schultz would have... The economy is backward-looking, and Chatelain, who's got this backward-looking belief, um, he's called it right, or she's called it right, then Chatelain will be the winner. But in reality, is the economy is hybrid, both forward and backward looking, and you can think of that as the structure of the economy we looked at earlier on, then Clegg, she will be right, because she would have called it right. But the important thing is there, even if they have these beliefs, they don't know for certain what the economy is going to look like. And therefore, who is the winner in the world in which we don't know for certain the structure of the economy? It's actually Clegg, because Clegg can never do better than come second in this race. So the rational choice is not to be a Schultz or a Chatelain, but it's to be a Clegg. So you make your choice about the structure of the economy hybrid, a convex combination. I don't know, so it's better off I treat the economy as some average across different types of models. That way, I will never come in third. I will always do better than someone else than otherwise. So there's another problem we face. So we've got the problem of using data, which might change. And the other problem is, however many draws or measures we have on the economy, we don't know really what it is, so we might be better off having a set of models that might guide us as to what we need to do. Don't rely on one on its own. The final problem I want to open to you is, is what if central bank is playing a game with the private sector. And imagine in this game, in the first instance, central bank and the private sector both think inflation is going to be low. Think of this as the period up to last year. And if they both work on the basis of being low, we'll be at our bliss point, because inflation will come in on target. But actually, if in that world, the private sector doesn't believe the central bank's going to try and hit a low inflation rate, and they think they're going to miss their inflation target and inflation will be higher, the private sector might shoot for a high wage rate. But if inflation turns out to be low, real wages will be high and activity will be low. We'll end up with a low level of output. We won't be in the place we want to be. But the problem is, if the private sector doesn't believe us, it has an incentive to deviate from the low inflation bliss point. Equally, if the central bank wants to, or the monetary authorities want to generate a high level of output, they will try and convince the um, private sector it's going to have a low level of output. But if, the, if they have an incentive to deviate by having a higher level of inflation, that will lower real wages and lead to a higher level of output. And that's where you get that position there. And if both sets of agents cannot commit credibly, you'll end up with inflation bias because this story will inexorably lead to high inflation. And this is, in some sense, the analysis we had of the period of the 1980s and the concern today. Will the inflation rate, because of the monetary, fiscal, and financial settlement we currently have, return to low, or will it stay high because we have an inflation bias? This is a question we need to think very hard about. The answer we came up with 25 years ago was for central bank independence. There was a social consensus of price stability. People realized inflation was a problem. I hope we haven't forgotten today. I can sense from some of the answers from some of you to the exercise this morning you haven't forgotten, and that's a good thing. But if there is a social consensus for price stability, it's got to be mandated by the body politic. That's got to decide what the inflation target is. But having decided it, it is still a completely appropriate under a democratic system for that, those choices about policy to be carried out by experts, just as we wouldn't want neurosurgeons uh, not to be the ones operating on my brain. We don't want people who aren't experts thinking about monetary policy. But what they do has to be accountable and set as a target by politicians. And so in May 1997, I've already highlighted, we had a move to central bank independence. And what I want to point out to you, and this is a, a paper I wrote many years ago with Charles Nolan, who's in the audience, that the, the reduction interest rates and this is interest rates at expectations up to 25 years. So as soon as that announcement was made, the simple announcement 
of that very morning, interest rates across the whole spectrum of interest rates fell by half a percent. So that paid um, the end to the story that central bank independence would lead to higher interest rates. It actually led to lower interest rates because we got rid of that inflation bias. Or something. And people say to themselves, look, we're not going to have an inflation bias because these guys will do their job. So interest rates fell across the board. Now, you can go away and calculate how much that has saved in interest payments over the last 25 years. It's a huge, huge benefit. It would be an interesting exercise to do. And if we look at economic performance in terms of inflation or output, that classic period from 93 to 2007, that I've called the long expansion in, in uh, uh, an earlier book, um, you can see the, you know, don't need econometrics here, but you could, just to look at the, the variance of activity that we saw in the, in the previous periods for inflation output and what we saw in a remarkable period of stability in UK activity. And even after the financial crisis, um, apart from the COVID years and the financial crisis, we were and yet still have a remarkable degree of st stability in the face of enormous shocks. Often said that the three shocks we've faced since the financial crisis, the financial crisis, Brexit, and COVID are once-in-a-lifetime shocks. They can't be really, can they? Because they've happened three times in 12 years. But these are huge shocks, and yet we've managed to maintain the inflation target. So I think the regime, in this sense, has been tested. So what's my summary? Summary is that commodity standards turned out to be too volatile, that we could do better. The sweep of history gave a democratic mandate for governments to try and do a better job. We tried to use control techniques, but humans are smarter than machines. I will still maintain that to the end of my life, despite what colleagues in AI tell me. They will learn. We need to design rules and think of uh, responses and games and manage expectations of institutional, uh, institutional structures and commitment technologies. And this is all designed to guarantee the public good of money, to facilitate exchange, a unit of account, a measure of what we do, enable us to plan our lives and those of those who are close to us, understanding what level of goods and services the income that we have in our pocket is able to purchase. Now, if I could just wind up. The two individuals, the names are already there, I guess you'd already guess, are Adam Smith and David Hume. Adam Smith on the right, uh, oh, sorry, on the left, David Hume on, on the right. Of course, next year, has already been told, is the uh, tier centenary of Adam Smith's birth. And the reason I mention them in this lecture today is it had an enormous impact on early monetary thinking. David Hume's famous essay of the impact of money on the economy explained the extent to which an increase in money had a temporary impact on activity, but not a permanent one. It's a beautiful bit of prose. I'll leave you to find it and read it in your own time. And Adam Smith was a great supporter of the development of the banking system as a way of helping productivity and investment in the economy and encouraging people to put their savings to good use. A very important insight from the wealth of nations in there. The bank system, we think now, can be the source of problems. We know that. But actually, at its inception, was an incredibly important part of the Industrial Revolution and the spread of savings around the country. And I want to thank, in this very room, Adam Smith for that insight. And also, for those of you who want to know, they had a, a very voluminous literary correspondence with each other. And at one point, um, uh, David Hume was thinking of going down to London uh, or live somewhere else. He said, I've had enough, I don't know why he said, I've had enough of Scotland, I want to live somewhere else. And uh, Adam Smith said to him, well, you don't want to live in France, as you can see from the first paragraph. And actually, Adam Smith encouraged him to go and live in London. And if you forgive me, I'll read out the bottom paragraph. Your objections to London appear to me, appear to be without foundation. The hatred of Scotchmen can subsist, he's talking about London, even at present, among nobody but the stupidest of people. And it is such a piece of nonsense that it must pall even among them in a 12-month. And what he was saying was that if you move to London, you will eventually be accepted, you will get some public jobs, and people will start to listen to you. It's a very interesting point about the circulation of people in this country, but also the incredibly sensible points that Adam Smith is making to David Hume. It will take time to get accepted. And for any of us who have moved around the country, whether it's to university or you stay in Glasgow, it often does. 
take time to get accepted. And that's exactly what Adam Smith was telling David Hume all those years ago. So why did we move away from a quality back currency? Because we could do better. That is the essential answer, because we could do better. What, central, what have central banks learned about short-term demand management? It's difficult. <laughs> Let's not be too ambitious. Keep it simple. I think the next word is stupid, but I should, probably shouldn't use that. Just keep it simple. Limit your ambition. Be clear about your objectives and just try to hit them time after time. And finally, do we need to adopt a different monetary policy objective? I'm afraid my answer is no. All the things that I have read suggest that we should continue to aim for price stability and not give central banks a broader mandate to pursue things for which they don't have the instruments or, more importantly, the social consensus to carry those things out. It's very, very important that any institution doesn't overreach the consensus for its activity. Otherwise, it will lose the mandate to do what it should be doing and can do best. I have finished. Thank you. <laughs> It was, it was chosen wisely. It was chosen wisely. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, in Italy at the moment, a lot of, in the press, there's a lot of pressure on the BC mm. and the European Central mm. Bank. So could you say a bit about, that, you know, is independence really um, solving the inflation problem or really this was a period which was very benign and now that we're in more difficult mm. times, then we have uh, actually central banks are just about under as much pressure mm. to try to... Uh, align itself with public opinion. Well, sir, I'd expect nothing else than a brilliant question. Um, so so it, it's absolutely clear that, that the central bankers who have accepted the, uh, the gauntlet to, to achieve price stability are very serious about it. I have no sense in which any central banker I've talked to in the last decade doesn't treat price stability as their main objective and will do whatever they can to try to get there. So, but within that, I think there are some really important issues. One is, as you said, the escalation inflation that we're seeing is new. It's the first time in a generation we've had to deal with this problem. And there was a, maybe a concern about whether the playbook, um, so the kind of things you have to do when inflation starts to escalate, was, had perhaps been forgotten. That's why we kind of have these kinds of talks to remind ourselves as to what the appropriate responses were. And, and therefore, it seems to me much more like a tactical mistake last year not to have done more in respect of inflation rather than anything to do with political pressure. But I think one of the reasons those questions emerge is that the central bank balance sheet is now so closely intertwined with that of the fiscal policy authority, it does look as though there is a stronger relationship than there was in the past, which means much, there means, needs to be much clearer statements as to the fact there is no uh, constraint on the central bank in terms of raising interest rates because each of the central banks that are holding large amounts of government bonds will be showing significant losses as interest rates start to go up. So, so I, 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 I suspect it's, it's both tactical uh, in terms of last year and also a need for more explanation as to how these central bank balance sheets will work their way through as interest rates start to normalise. And supposing we get to find our way through the current inflationary mm. shock get back into some lower inflation equilibrium. And let's even suppose that those central bank um, balance sheets are, are one down. Mm. Um, and here I'm asking mm. you to make a prediction of this balance, which is always dangerous. Do you think there will could be a loss of credibility because people just don't know what central banks will do because they do have the possibility of engaging in instruments like quantitative easing in the future and, mm. and to repeat the playbook of the last 10 years? I mean, what do you think might happen once we're through this phase? Or do you need more commitment technologies? Well, we, 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 yeah, I, mean, I think the commitment technology we need is, is, is to limit the ambition of what the central banks are about. 
I've seen uh, you know, a, 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 a real danger that they're encroaching into areas that, or being asked to encroach into areas they, they shouldn't be. And I think that, that refocus on the objective of price stability uh, and, th and being very clear about the extent to which different scenarios have been judged and that we're on a path that is the least worst seems to me to be something that needs to be better explained. Um, and as we sort of, you know, as we go through the shocks in the next few years, I can I entirely imagine, um, unless we can get interest rates back to more normal levels, that people may want to re-engage with quantitative easing. I think one of the problems is that quantitative easing has gone from a temporary intervention to almost the first response in the most recent past. And I think there just needs to be a period where we move away from it altogether. I don't think it's necessary. But what we hear is the bond markets will scream blue murder about this because they're the ones losing from this process. Open it up. Yes. Uh, so I think that I think maybe for Han Han's first question, and I think it's more for mm. personal like judgment on the matter, is whether or not this time that like you mentioned that at the beginning mm. we saw inflation picking up, was it just perhaps central banks acted before giving time for the effects to go through, or was it just purely an underestimation of the demand response following the COVID pandemic? <laughs> It, it could, I mean, you know, we've got papers coming for the next 10 years trying to, trying to identify all of that. Look, what we do know is after huge economic dislocations, we often see an inflation or a recession. We saw after World War I, after World War II, and after the huge oil price shocks and the end of the Norman Lanker in 1970. So in a sense, none of this should be surprising. I, I, I'd say the only thing that, that surprised or disappointed me was, was some reluctance to start the normalisation. Uh, I've been, you know, whether this was in COVID, I've been asked, you know, generally I've been in the view that central banks should be more courageous in normalisation. I don't think it's been the problem uh, that they often think it is. Uh, but what we've had is, because of the successive shocks we had after Brexit and COVID, uh, is even more quantitative easing as a stock than we originally envisioned. I think we've just got ourselves even deeper into the hole with this quantitative easing thing. So we need to plot our way out of that, I think is the biggest issue. And so there was the concern, I don't think it was true, but there was a perception from some that the reluctance to start last year was all to do with the size of the central bank balance sheets and the extent to which that might affect their profit and loss account. I, I'll be clear, I don't think that was what was driving, driving central bankers, but as I said earlier on, the perceptions matter when people start to think in this way. Um, Thank you. Did, didn't manage to keep any of the audience, though. <laughs> yeah. I think T Tolstoy comes to mind, right? That all, all happy economies are the same. All unhappy economies are, are different in their own way. Uh, I mean, it, it's a standard question. Everyone seems to ask, what, how, how is it done in other countries? And, and what you often discover is they're often facing exactly the same problems. So I, the two examples are when I... One of the, one of the nice things about being in NISA is, is that um, the, the um, e economists uh, allocated to the London embassies just want to come in and chat about what's going on in their economy. So the French uh, guys came in a few weeks ago talking about the state of their economy. It just sounded just like ours like in everything that was going on. It was so similar. And then we had the Indian planning minister, former planning minister, Montek Alawalia, come in and have a chat. And the way they talked about productivity, underperformance, and the inability to get the economy growing far, it could have just replaced UK with India with all the things. So, so in a global economy, it's very likely that we're, we're, we're dealing with the same shocks in a similar way. But that said, I do think our Phillips curve has become, has become steeper because of Brexit. So a given demand shock has more of an impact on the price level than it would prior to Brexit. There's increasing evidence that trade has compressed in this period, and we were very closely aligned in terms of trade with the European Union. This is not a statement about reversing Brexit or anything. I get into terrible trouble down south 
even mentioning the word, but this is simple. Yeah, I know, I know, but geez, you don't know what it's like. <laughs> um, uh, but this is you know, simply a result of reading the research that's been undertaken that suggests that it seems to have an extra. And then, of course, when we add in COVID, what was also clear is that because of our greater reliance on uh, uh, bits of industry that required um, you know, recreation, hospitality, uh, tourism, our economy was more susceptible to a COVID-type shock than others. And our health and education sectors also plummeted more as well. So it seemed to me our downturn was steeper and our recovery took a bit longer for, for UK-specific reasons. So I, I think what's interesting in all of this, when we do this analysis, is, is what's common and what's different. So many of the things are, are common, but actually many of the things that happen in the UK seem to happen a little bit worse than they do in some other countries. And that's interesting for, for me to be thinking about what the policy consequences of, 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 of those differences. And I'm afraid a lot of it comes down to uh, the operation of, of, of government policy, which is incredibly short run and crisis management. One, one of my favorite books to, for telling people to read in the last couple of years is the um, biography of Jeremy Haywood by his wife, Susan, which will just explain how policy gets done in this country. No one does anything, and then there's a disaster, and then it's always five men get in a room in the cabinet office and decide what to do. And that's the answer. Hooray. It, 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 it's ridiculous. There doesn't seem to be anything going on in terms of long-term planning, particularly as far as I can tell. I'm sure Anton will tell me that's not fair. No. <laughs> Of course. Um, wondering whether, just in the qualitative assessment, um, the hedonic quality adjustments that we're seeing with the sort of proliferation of first as goods, mm. um, whether that serves to sort of artificially dampen our assessment of the inflation we're seeing right now. Mm. Also, with the inflation recovery paths, you know, sort of mm. we keep getting readjusted to be uh, sort of postponed. Mm. I'm wondering if we're seeing any sort of hysteresis Well, I make one prediction: is that you're going to go far in this profession if you adopt it. So I'll that, that's that's straight. That's brilliant, brilliant questioning. And one thing about um, inflation or measures of inflation, I, I put up in the chart the, the old measure from 1947, the retail price index, as well as CPI. And depending upon the nature of the shocks and the particular weighting, you'll often see differences on a temporary basis from them. So RPI, we now think might hit fif nearly 15 percent. You know crazy number in, in UK terms, where CPI 8 or 9%. So, so we know that depending upon the shocks and the weights, there may be differences. But in the very long run, four, five, six years, they all kind of move together. So it doesn't particularly matter. Uh, I know it sounds like it, it should, but it, it doesn't. There is a long run trend bringing them all together. So if you're stabilizing one, you're stabilizing all the others. Historically, RPI was about a percent above CPI because it's whole, it incorporates housing costs and interest payments, and we're a country that likes to buy housing. So, so, but if you're pinning one down, you're pinning down all the others. So that's a partial answer uh, to your first question. Your sec second question was, are we getting more persistent? Um, why, wh why are the, so I, I think that's just a learning, you know, learning about the shocks. You're, you're kind of, so let me go back a step. I, I think the way we try and understand what shock the economy is being hit by is to project a forecast of what we think when that turns out to be wrong, because it surely will, you use that to identify the shock the economy is being hit by. So you try and work out, well, there's the gap. Which shock best explains all the gaps that you see? Then you know what shock you've got. Then you can try and understand how you respond to it. So actually the mistakes or the changes in the forecast path are a way of understanding what's happening. It's a narrative. I hope that is at least a partial answer. But I think you've got a career ahead of you in this discipline. G give them a scholarship. <laughs> he hasn't already got one. No, I I don't think so. I'm audible, right? Yes. Very loud. Mm. Uh, no, fascinating uh, lecture. I, I think in the past you have also talked about price level targeting. So mm. now you are saying that inflation targeting is appropriate. Is your argument that we are still, by and large, not that far away from the period of great moderation, yeah. despite the COVID years, nothing yeah. really has changed. Is that the argument that, it, that, that you are making here? Would, would a different um, you know, regime of 
inflation continued inflation, mm. uh, you know, uh, yeah. might, so, might, uh, yeah. this is a very different way of thinking. Thank you. So there are, there are two parts to that answer. One is, there's a strong set of beliefs, and you might want to read Chris Pissaridi's interview in the FT today, which is excellent, on, you know, can, so the UK's long-standing productivity problem, which is the real side, not the nominal side, of trying to find interventions that can solve it. And we go back to the kind of rock, rocking horse model 1960s. The view is there, if, if you can run the economy hot, people will learn forms of innovation, and that will help productivity. I, I don't think it, it kind of works like that. I think you need much more targeted interventions to help the supply side. So that's very much about vocational education, infrastructure, training, better access to finance. The, these are the things we really need if we want the economy to do better. So if that's the case, that's all about understanding the economy better, giving more power to regional and devolved nations to uncover their own problems. That's one set of stuff we need. If we take that as given, then the nominal regime doesn't particularly matter. You just need something that kind of works. And an inflation target seems to work. I don't like the idea of an average inflation target. That's a trend price level target, and for the following reason. We've now had an overshoot in inflation. Do we seriously think the Federal Reserve will now invent a deeper recession to bring the price level path back to its original path just for the sake of hitting it? It won't. So even adopting that as a target doesn't make sense to me. Because having had a positive inflation, it's far better to let bygones be bygones rather than try and reverse it with an even deeper recession to try and get us back on the price level path. Now, of course, the argument by the, really, the, the forward-looking monsters in all of this is that by having that kind of, people will adjust accordingly so it will all be seamless. I don't think it works like that. I think it's much stickier. So, please, you said that I'd have inflation <laughs> targeting because I was going to be my next question. Because actually, some people have argued that even prior to the Ukraine shock, mm. One of the problems was that because of lower inflation, mm. actually this built in additional inflationary mm. expectations simply mm. because people said, oh, it's an average inflation yeah, target. That's right. so, so you could actually expect, we now expect yeah. more inflation yeah. in the future. So it's actually may have made things worse. Yes. Is, is, is the bank of England sort of seriously considering nominal GDP targeting? It, it, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't. it shouldn't be. I mean, this is Jim O'Neill being 20 years out of date. I sat next to, there's a TV from Parliament when he's sitting next to me in the Treasury Committee saying that, and there's a, my face looking rather annoyed at him. He's just one of these, sorry, I mean, I, I know he's a peer of the realm and all that stuff, but it, it, it's, it, it doesn't, it, look, okay, what are the arguments against? I'm, Charles can help me with all this, but, you know, CPI doesn't get revised. Nominal GDP comes in with great lags. We don't know what's happened to nominal GDP. It continues to get revised for at least three years after the fact. So you might have to continue to move policy because we don't know what's happened to the normal GDP. So if we had currency technologies such as you know, CBDCs, yeah. which could actually, in sort of real time, mm. sort of figure out mm. the, the GDP swells and mm. flows on an industry level, mm. would normal GDP then be somewhat realistic? Well, um, it's a sense in which I think we've got you know, a target for inflation, which we know how to control, real GDP um, is part of nominal GDP, which is incredibly hard to forecast in the short run. So even if we have that technology, it's going to be heavily revised. Just if you get some time, ask someone to show you revisions of GDP. It's, it's, it's absolutely enormous. So you, it seems to me you're going to be more likely to setting incorrect policy with a noisy indicator than you are with something like inflation. You know, no matter how good the information is. But it's a good question. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. That's Thank you very much for the lecture. I have a sort of poorly developed question, but I just wanted to give you a bit of the 2010s. Mm. The, obviously, the, you know, inflation is not the end outcome that you're aiming for, low inflation. Is the 2010s not one of the worst periods for living standards on record? I mean, even the 70s, I think, saw some real wage growth, whereas mm. the 2010s, very little or none. Um, is that not a failure of policy? I'm really worried that the extent to which we can really think of the bank as having a social you know, mandate, mm. if it's, to what extent is it delivering the optimal yeah. policy mix, or okay. is it just the second best policy mix in the government? Well, perhaps okay, the well, perfect. So I wrote an article in Prospect about this just last month on the fact we got the wrong policy mix. But the productivity side, the real side of the economy, is not the bank's concern. 
You know, that is for long-run planning, a proper department of the economy, which the Treasury isn't. The Treasury is, forgive me for anyone who's accountant, I have the utmost respect for accountants, but it is a department of accountancy. So it, all, all it's worried is, is how much is going to be spent and how we raise the money. It doesn't deal with whether it's investment or consumption by the state or whether it helps net worth. So, um, I mean, in many ways, the problem we've had is that the whole weight of macroeconomic management has fallen on the bank. So the bank looks like it's taken the blame for this low productivity, uh, you know, this crawling of productivity, when in fact it's nothing to do with the bank at all. It's to do with, you know, obviously private sector, that's most of the responsibility for productivity growth, but also a state that hasn't provided sufficient development of the initial conditions required for, gr for growth to occur. And we know all of that, right? Infrastructure, finance, education, you know, it, it, it's kind of economics 101. Very much excellent. Mm. Do you think that we're in a second best world, though, where if the government's not doing enough, it's still best to have an independent central bank that's perhaps... Well, well I, I don't know how it would affect productivity. I don't know how... Uh, how what, would you, what would you have the central bank do? Decide who gets lent the money? I mean, it's not their job. It's just absolutely not. It's helping the plumbing of the financial system so that banks aren't short of money when they need it and in working on price stability. I, I just don't see what tools they have at their disposal. I know that it's a debate that comes up time and time again, and there was talk about having a mandate for well-being for the central bank, but I just don't begin to understand how they do that. Thomas. This is probably as much a comment as a question, but it's... You know, Very good. <laughs> Talk to me about it. Well, I think, you know, as ever, you're, you're absolutely right. I, you know, the big three policy-making committees at the bank, the, the FPC, the PRA, and, and the MPC, are reflective of exactly that. And uh, many of us have argued, I mean, I need to do, I, mean, I need to read more of your papers, but many of us have argued that the FPC and the MPC should be combined to be thinking about one particular policy-making body because it's hard to think of a world in which financial conditions don't impact on monetary conditions and vice versa. And that might help the... What I'm calling for, I think, is a simplification of the central bank objectives. It's just too involved in too many different parts of policy. And actually, on the underpinning of that as well, is that a, a large amount of government um, doesn't have enough economists at disposal. So it's regularly turning to bank economists for advice and support rather than having it in-house. So it's been a way of kind of uh, developing expertise across the way. So the bank is more involved in that than it ought to be as well, it seems to me. Rather than yeah, supporting. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's fine. Well, I said I, said I should read, read some of your stuff. It's been difficult running this <laughs> to get time to read everything. <laughs> yeah. 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 
Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas having that always inside the bank really is quite problematic. Yeah. No, I, 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 I can see that uh, now you put it that way. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah I, mean, I suppose I was. I, I mean, it, it, I, Yeah. Well, that, that and then the government comes in and looks out at health devices and offset and distribution This is monetary fiscal coordination, financial fiscal coordination at a very deep level. Yeah. And we see it, this happened in New Zealand too, mm. similar uh, correlation of mm. policies that look very much like causation, yeah. very much like joint policy formulation. And this was not presented by the so, so, so I think that's right. The, the, you know, the financial policy decisions are intensely political in the way that they Im impact on... I mean, how does, how does the banking or the financial sector reduce risk? Well, it's by lending less to poorer people. You know, that's incredibly bad distributionally. And, uh, you know, I've got papers that look at that as well. And, I, and that's kind of why I was thinking about coordination. But the idea of having the FPC somewhere else altogether seems to me is, is a very, very sensible idea. Because this is always affecting the poorer and, and the people who are first-time buyers. That's how they reduce their risk, which seems to me to be, politically speaking, particularly problematic. That's what's going on. Exactly. Thank you, Charles. I think we've got one last question. Mm. Sure. Over to you. Sure. Jackson, thanks so much for this lecture. This uh, so amazing. One question. You touched upon the team tampering versus team yeah. Along the lines, which was passing through my mind for a long time, because it's also difficult for me to understand mm. the, Yes. Um, that, if we need to think through their mind, uh, to, to the minds of the people who think that there's uh, damning permanent risk, do you think it is um, perceptions about also credibility or new challenges? Uh, you, you said, for example, that the trade off is different. Yeah. So, or both, what, what do you think it is in the minds of the, the team permanent, uh, as a result of which they think that there are permanent effects? I, I, I had difficulty understanding the argument in, in the sense in which, you know, the best way to make the inflation temporary was to treat it as permanent. <laughs> so, you know, you've got to take a step back and say, what's your responsibility here? It's not to try and understand or predict whether it's temporary or not. It's to see the inflation pressure rising, understand the constellation of the economy at the moment, and respond and say, I'm going to continue to respond until inflation looks like it's on the track to return again. And, indeed, to make the further argument that I still might do less than I might do optimally, because I think right now, with the economy ruptured or not fully re-engaged, I might have more output volatility than I might otherwise have, so I'm going to go more cautiously and gradually than I would have done. I just don't know why those arguments weren't made last year. It, it befuddled me at the time. That said, there's still time to get it right. So I kind of reject the whole team. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that it started doing the circles in the States. So we're just, sorry, be careful what I said. We just followed it mindlessly here. And I, I, didn't, really, I didn't really understand it. But so many things I don't understand. That's what keeps me going. <laughs> <laughs> well, rather so, listen, thank you very much yeah. for delivering the lecture. Thank you for engaging in, in the Q&A. Uh, I, I have actually got through half your book already, oh, okay. so uh, it, which is a, a great read. Actually, huh? you'll see, you'll recognise many of the diagrams that Jack did put up in, in the book, and it's actually a, a really good read through the history of, of central banking and the issues that uh, you know, the problems of, of, of designing a, a monetary system that works. But can I thank you on behalf of the Royal Canadian Society? Can I thank you on behalf of the university? And uh, can I give our speaker a round? Anton, may I? I
I, I've never done, I've, I've always wanted to do this. I've never done this before, but I'll, I'll, may I present to the University of Glasgow a copy of the book for the, for the library? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. much, much, much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I look forward to, uh, to presenting it to our librarian. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.